All right, we're going to get started with our webinar. We have lots covered today. Next slide, please. So again, I'm Hannah Kramer um, with LBNL, and joining me today is David Landman from Pure Energy Information Solutions. Uh, he's our guest presenter, and we're going to be talking about how uh, FBD can really help building operators manage their building during pandemic mode. So it's a really interesting uh, set of slides he has, and we're going to save plenty of time for Q&A at the end, um, definitely to get your questions in. So. Um, I'm going to give you a little background on David, and then we'll do a couple of housekeeping items. Um, so David Landman is an energy and sustainability expert with over 25 years of experience in this field. He's provided the development and use of big data analytics for over 300,000 BAS points of various control systems in education, healthcare, life science, federal, and commercial and industrial industries. And his experience includes managing vendors and project development teams, as well as developing over 10 million worth of energy projects. So David has a lot of experience implementing FDD in the field. And uh, so get your, get your thoughts going about how you can ask him about your systems or your potential future systems in using uh, to help you support pandemic operations. So if you have questions during the presentation, submit them in the question box. I'm going to be monitoring all the questions. I may interrupt if they're just a quick clarification, but otherwise we're going to have at least 15 minutes or more at the end. Um, so get your questions in early as we don't always have time to get through all the questions. And there are a lot of attendees on this webinar. Uh, the webinar is recorded. Uh, the slides and uh, the recording will be posted on the Better Buildings website. You'll get a link to that in an email following this webinar a, a day or two after the webinar. All right, next slide, please. So we're just going to do a quick background on energy management information systems um, to put FDD in context. And then we're going to have David uh, take it away with talking about FDD with COVID operations and have the Q&A. Next slide, please. All right, so first, uh, EMIS. Most of you have already heard about uh, EMIS, and it's, it comes under various names, but um, in this case, we're talking about uh, the, the energy information systems, fault detection and diagnostic systems, and automated system optimization. So in this graphic we have here, uh, that data, data analytics piece is really where uh, we're talking about the EMIS, the technology that supports building operators in managing their building, finding uh, opportunities for savings, finding faults, et cetera. Uh, so in the context here, we have data collection. You, you aggregate that data. Uh, you perform analytics on that data. That's where the automated portions come in. Um, outside of the tool, you have to implement. So this is a key piece in relation to fault detection. Um, it's telling you a bunch of faults are in your building, uh, mostly focused on the HVAC system and you're going and verifying those faults and correcting them. So it gives you the, the eyes on the, on the controls that you otherwise wouldn't be able to have manually across very complex building systems and in many, many data points. And then the other benefit of EMIS is monitoring over time. So rather than uh, fixing something and hoping it stays fixed, you have an ability to make sure quickly through data um, and verify savings um, in different ways. So that's, that's uh, EMIS in a nutshell. Um, next slide, please. We have just completed the Smart Energy Analytics campaign, which many of you know about. Um, but if you don't know about it, uh, here are the reports and uh, resources that came out of the final stages of the campaign. Uh, we, we cataloged the benefits and costs and use cases of EMIS. We had over 105 building portfolio owners involved, and many of them are on the call today. So I just wanted to thank you for your contributions to this research. And you know, we were able to aggregate um, a huge data set and put together all the data behind um, savings and payback and technology adoption practices um, in order to share this broadly. So we created this final report there on the left um, the middle is an application showcase which summarizes 
uh, a lot of our award-winning campaign participants and their best practices. And then on the right, we created an infographic to really kind of explain the value proposition in a nutshell. Um, so these results are not just for owners and building managers and energy managers. We want to share these broadly. Um, so if um, you know of a utility or other policymakers that might benefit from this information, you can uh, let us know or let them know and they can reach out to us. Um, we're here to help uh, get, the, get the word out about the results of this research. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Next slide, please. I wanted to just also frame this conversation in terms of all the work that Better Buildings has done to pull together resources related to COVID-19. Um, there's so many different resources out there, and I think this website through the Better Building Solution, Solution Center is a nice springboard to get to those resources in an organized fashion. Um, you have your ASHRAE resources, they've pulled together market sector specific resources, technology specific resources. There's been a series of webinars. I will point out the one um, shown here in the top right corner from December 7th, uh, another LBNL. Uh, uh, scientists described kind of like the nuts and bolts of all the mitigation strategies and issues around how COVID-19 is spread. So it's a, a really good primer in um, understanding how it affects building operation. Uh, and then there's other white papers and guidance documents. So today's webinar has this different lens. You know, we're going to talk about the mitigation strategies for how you operate your building in pandemic mode but we're not going to talk about like why you would do X, Y, or Z because there's other webinars about that. We're going to talk about how you use FDD to support you in those practices, whichever practices you may choose based on this other literature um, around mitigation strategies. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to David. He's going to talk in the next slide about uh, the different levels of mitigation strategies. Thanks, Anna. And thanks everyone for joining. So um, as Hannah said, we're going to go over some of the different uh, methods that people have in terms of uh, selecting FDDs, what to do with them uh, under pandemic modes. So what you're looking at here is basically a mitigation of risk. We're gonna focus our talk on the engineering control section in the middle of how do we impact things that we can um, see and touch through the control systems. Uh, increased ventilation, UVC, filtration, things like that. It's not really talking about PPE, uh, administrative controls, elimination. So the assumption is the buildings are in use to some extent or another, and what are we doing with those buildings and how is it being impacted under COVID? Next slide. So ASHRAE has several recommendations of how to operate the building. Again, this is uh, more so about how do we react to what ASHRAE recommends. So a lot of what you see on the left side has to do with outside air, increasing ventilation, dilution, demand control ventilation, what percent outside air, they recommend raising it as high as 100%. And then some of the systems on the right, how do you impact the filtration? Can you raise it as high as MERV 13 or higher? What happens uh, if we want to run the systems longer, different flush systems in terms of bringing in more outside air, more air change rates, or adding additional equipment in terms of air cleaners with HEPA filters, portable ones, or adding a new system to deal with the virus itself, a UVGA, UVGI or UVC system added to the air handler in the rooms themselves. So ASHRAE has a lot of recommendations and how is it impacted under uh, COVID. Next slide, please. So what are the benefits of changes to the existing FDD? Well, if you have an FDD system in the first place, you're obviously interested in the data and having a, a healthier building. So when we're looking at it under the um, COVID conditions, we're looking at healthy building and healthy occupants. And how do we do that? We're looking at things like CO2, we're looking in percent outside air. We wanna make sure that mold levels are kept down. You were doing it before COVID, where well, you wanna still continue to do that now. What happens with false positive flags? FDD provides a tremendous amount of information. Well, how do we put that into a 
a place where you can actually get valuable information on both pre, during, and post COVID-19. How do we mitigate the energy impacts? There's some things that you would do beforehand. What can you do now and what are you gonna do later on in terms of reducing your energy consumption and uh, reducing the energy impacts? Next slide, please. So where does it all start? There are, it starts with coordination. We need to identify the players and their responsibilities. There needs to be a feedback and exchange of information between all parties. Operations before, during, and after may be different. So we have to get different people involved. On the facility side, you have the facilities department, which is kind of the core. They're involved with everything. They get the buy-in from the ownership, and they also deal with uh, the EMIS vendor, or potentially even in-house, will they be making the changes to the FDD. And they also have the controls vendor themselves who will be providing changes to the controls. Uh, it's important that you have good communication between all these people, because if one operates in isolation, you're not gonna be operating the building effectively under COVID-19 conditions. And you wouldn't be operating it under any conditions very effectively that way also if one's not talking to the other. So we don't want things operating in isolation. So in the facilities group, for example, they may still change the filters on the old schedule, but now that you have MER 13 filters added, well, the frequency probably needs to be more frequent than that. And the controls vendor may not have changed the sequence to indicate that it needs to be replaced because of the higher pressure drop. And the EMIS vendor may not have updated the rules to allow for flags based on the new conditions. So some rules are gonna to need to be written due to changes in operation. Others won't occur or need to be suppressed. And the team, when it works together, building occupants can be assured that the building is healthier. Next slide, please. So let me talk a little bit more about that. There are basically going to be three changes to your FDD. Some of your rules need to be modified to operate under the new conditions based on what you're planning to implement or currently implementing under operations for COVID-19. Some of the rules will need to be suspended. They're actually doing the opposite where beforehand you were running them for energy savings. Now you need to shut them off and suspend them because you're not as focused on the energy savings, but you're more focused on the health of the building. Then additional rules will also need to be created. Maybe there are additional uh, systems that have been installed like UVC, or you've added portable air cleaners or other equipment, and you need to make changes by adding additional rules and then paying attention to those during under COVID-19 conditions. Next slide, please. Let's start with the first one, outside air ventilation. Uh, under FDD, there are a significant number of rules that are typically written for uh, outside air ventilation based on ASHRAE conditions, doing comparisons with temperature. Some people control economizers based on enthalpy, DCVs usually based on CO2, and um, outside air could also be based on schedule. So there are a lot of initial rules that have been written and have currently working based on that. And what happens to them? How are we going to modify them? And how we, what's gonna to happen to FDD when we modify them? Next slide, please. Let's take a, an example. Under normal conditions pre-COVID, this is a schematic of a typical air handling unit. It has return air in it, it has outside air, and the economizer is able to provide um, uh, different amounts of outside air down to a minimum of 20% outside air. In the normal flag, you see the mixed air temperature, the MAT is 46 degrees. So the outside air damper is actually providing 50% outside air. So this would normally be flagged as a damper problem or based on the mixed air temperature. And as a result of it, the preheat valve is opening to increase the temperature from 46 to 53 degrees. So they're using extra heating energy as a result of this. So under normal conditions, you would have this flagged as an economizer related problem. Next slide, please. So um, while the 
under the original condition, you could potentially save a certain amount of energy. Under the new condition, we're changing Can you do, uh, sorry, that shows the results. Can you show the next slide? Thank you. So under the new conditions, ASHRAE says to raise the percent outside air. I'm just showing an example to bring it to 40%. Some people may bring it to 100% outside air. If we're talking about an environment like Boston, under the old conditions, if the economizer was working properly, you could get down to zero degrees without even needing any heat to be able to provide the amount of heating in, in this specific example of an air handling unit. However, if you have to bump it up to 40% outside air minimum, then you can only use the economizer down to 25 degrees before you require additional heating. So there's going to be additional heating as a result of it. And um, you need to make sure that your system size large enough to be able to provide the heating. And the flip side, we, we're in the winter now, but during the summertime, the opposite would have happened where you could have issues with humidity and mold conditions. So you have to be careful with how much outside air you're putting into the uh, to the building. Now, in a temperate climate, there's going to be a little impact, though, because there's very little heating or cooling. So this is more impactful in an environment that's very hot and humid or very cold. Next slide, please. So what happens as a result of, of COVID? So the initial rules talked about comparisons of outside air, temperature, mixed air, and return air, enthalpy comparisons, DCV, outside air based on scheduling. So one of the rules that has to be suspended now is going to be the DCV mode. You don't suspend it, it's going to do the opposite of what you expect. You don't actually want it uh, operating under uh, COVID conditions. But you also need to modify and add a rule or a flag when DCV is now on. So the old one needs to be shut off temporarily and a new one needs to be created for when it's on because you don't want it operating for safety reasons. So instead of looking at the energy, you're looking at the safety reasons. There's potentially more energy used when we're writing with operating with more air. The outside air rules have to be changed based on the schedule. So if you're changing it based on um, people coming in at eight in the morning initially and now it's people coming in at, at 10 in the morning, or not at all, you can change the rules. You can actually potentially save some energy as a result of not bringing outside air if people aren't in the spaces. But the conditions need to be um, modified with the rules. Next slide, please. The next area would be occupancy schedule. Under initial rules, you have rules that are developed based on um, People occupancy, HVAC occupancy, again, if people are coming in eight to five or eight to six during the, the weekday, expect the systems to be operating a little before that and a little after that. And they might also have a pre-cooling mode um, in the Northeast at least to pre-cool the space uh, during the summertime as well as optimum start and stop. So they're preset rules that are developed based on the current occupancy schedule. So what happens again under COVID. So now you're under COVID conditions. Is the building occupied? Is the room occupied? How do we adjust these? What's going on with it? Is it saving more energy? Is it uh, using more energy? We need to uh, modify the rules. Next slide, please. So here's an example of that same air handling unit. If it's operating 12 hours a day, for example, assuming it's operating normally. And on the right, you'll see this is a, a yearly profile. If we're looking at a normal flag, you can see the, the yellow indicates pretty much when the system turns on in the morning and when it shuts off at nighttime. And then it doesn't have much weekend use. There's a little additional usage in the summertime due to additional cooling. But the flags would be, okay, how many days is it left on? So about three quarters of the way across, you can see there are times that the, the air handlers were left on beyond their normal hours of occupancy. So the flag would change to um, the real big flag when those times occurred. Now we're operating under COVID and one of the options is to run under 24 hours a day. Again, so the facility staff will ask the um, 
will either make the changes themselves or work with the BAS vendor to change the operations of the air handler to run 24 hours a day. So what happens then? You may be using more heating, cooling, fan energy, the f uh, filters will require more place replacements more frequently, and the FDD rules now need to be modified because if they aren't, it's going to be flagging all the time that the sh system should be off. And I'm showing the um, the more energy use, but the flip side could occur also. You may have a room that's now basically off all the time, and you could you need to change flags to indicate well they were running at this schedule. Is it an override? Why is it now operating with less energy, less uh, less time? Next slide, please. So again, the, the rules. The, um, I've stated some of them, but just to kind of sum up, you have initial rules based on startup, systems left in override or not running according to the occupied schedule initially. And then you'll have modified rules. So um, what happens with new heating and cooling rules? Maybe the heating and cooling is not used anymore. They're, they're letting it run 24 seven, but they don't let the heating and cooling run that time. You need to modify the existing rules to indicate what the current uh, schedule is like. And the same thing with startup. Are they using more outside air to flush the system? There's potentially more energy used operating it this way, or potentially less if you can set back systems that aren't in use anymore. And next slide, please. Here's another example. Uh, we talked about um, outside air conditions. Well, another way to modify conditions under COVID is through ACH air change for hour rates increases as well as additional uh, filtration. So rules are created to find the faults within the operating conditions. Uh, for example, uh, is a single VAV box driving pressure at the air handling unit? Well, it'll flag because the um, potential looking at the VAV box as well as looking at the, the air handler and indicating that the VFD is running close to maximum speed. Are these issues from coils not being cleaned? Uh, I actually, I once saw pressure drop in an air handler of over four inches or higher due to lack of maintenance. Uh, the coils were in such bad shape that they decided to just replace them. The unit went from uh, three air handling units operating near capacity to two air handling units with the third as a backup, which was part of the original design. So as part of the FDD original rules, that would be found. However, under the modified rules, you're going to have additional pressure drops. So you need to take that into account in terms of modified rules. And the same thing, if you've increased the air change rate, you need to take that into account by modifying the rules what, where you expect to see the fan and the, the pressures. So they need to accept the, the new operating conditions that the facilities people and the BAS vendor will implement. And we need to start uh, suppressing flags for alarms if they exist. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about maintaining zone conditions. Again, it's not necessarily recommending or not recommending, but in some environments, the FDD, the advantage of having FDD through the building automation system is you get to monitor the entire system. So you're looking at pretty much every point in the building automation system, which means every zone. So you can monitor zone temperatures, zone relative humidities, have comfort impacts uh, noted. Each individual one may not have a lot of savings, but you can look directly and find out which zones have which problems. Some uh, some clients use it like hotels to find out um, are they operating the the ranges as expected in the rooms from the thermostats. There are others that um, for a hospital environment or a library healthcare, where it's very important to maintain temperatures and relative humidity. So these may not have as much energy savings opportunities, but they're very important in terms of what's kept in those spaces. Well, under COVID, you may have to modify these rules or add new ones. In a lot of cases, the, um, the spaces actually do not have humidifiers in them. So the question becomes, are you going to add humidifiers to them? And the ones that do have them, Typically, the overriding factor is going to be based on the space conditions. Like I said, a library, uh, an operating room, or pharmaceutical, which requires certain space conditions. Uh, in a drier climate, if 
under COVID, if you're adding more humidification, this could be a significant energy user as well. The next slide, please. UVC. So there's been a lot of talk about adding UVC systems. Some add them to the air handling units, some add them to the, uh, the spaces themselves. It's it's not a new technology, it's been around for quite a while. Um, but you to add it, you need to add hardware, you had to install it, there are additional BAS points that are required, and there's an ongoing electricity cost for operating the UVC. And um, there are certain benefits as well, though, not just from the FTD, but you get cleaner coils typically if it's in place into the air handling system. So you could have less energy from lower pressure drops as well as um, lower maintenance costs because they don't need to go clean the coil as frequently because of the UVC. However, now we need to add additional rules for the additional equipment, such as adding power measurement for the lighting. We want to make sure that the lighting is on and we also want to make sure that it's operating as expected. So one would be an indication of power to the lighting. Another would be uh, time measurement because they only last so long. I believe, uh, depending what you're using, it could be a year and a half. And you want to make sure you replace this before it's um, no longer effective. This is not something you want to wait till afterwards. Some filters you maybe will wait a little longer, but uh, I wouldn't. I'd want to make sure the UVC is done early, if anything. So in most cases, uh, UVC will use less energy, but you also have to have the correct FDD in place to make sure it's operating the way it's supposed to. And again, this is something that you need to coordinate with the facilities person, the BAS vendor, and your EMIS vendor to make sure when it's installed, when the controls are installed, and the rules are written. So it's all operating in synergy. Uh, next slide, please. Heat recovery. So there are a lot of uh, systems out there with heat recovery, especially in, uh, we see a lot of them here in the Northeast, uh, talking more about heat wheels. So they're operated both for heating and, and cooling and um, initial rules for heat recovery are typically based on is the heat wheel operating and then is it operating under optimum conditions? Is it operating at the right outside air temperatures? Is it spinning at the right speed? Is it providing what it's supposed to to be effective? Um, I once had a, a customer that had a heat recovery system that was costing them over a thousand dollars a day during the winter time because it wasn't um, operating effectively. However, it had the um, the benefit that they had a heating coil that was sized properly, so even though it wasn't working, they were able to maintain the heating in there. So the people downstream were not concerned with heating. So this is one of those that you have to be concerned with. There are two different types of rules and how to operate the heat recovery system. In normal cases, we'd want to shut it off um, under COVID so there's no uh, contamination, suspend the rules. So it would it would flip around. So you'd want to make sure it's flags um, when it's operating because you don't want it to operate anymore. However, you also need to modify it because under low outside air temperature conditions, the heating system may not have been sized uh, large enough initially to handle the full load. So you may need to operate it under very cold conditions regardless of COVID or not, because you don't want a freezing building. So that would have the overriding factor and the rule needs to be modified to indicate that the temperature is getting too cold in there. Next slide, please. Flush mode. So it's another outside air type of fault. A lot of conditions uh, in the early morning where you may want to set it up to run, flush the building with 100% outside air for a short period of time to pre-cool it essentially. Or you may want to flush the system, uh, the building based on occupancy while well, they're coming at eight o'clock in the morning or even in the middle of the day if you have an opportunity to flush the systems. So uh, this could be more complicated during with modified rules because there are a lot of systems that are designed for demand response. They're setting back certain times of the day or even at nighttime. And we wanna make sure they all work together. So if you had a demand response one where you would normally uh, reduce the amount of outside air, this is a case where you might be doing the opposite. So you'd wanna uh, not 
look for the demand response. You'd want to be looking for flesh cycle and what the new ones that are implemented are. Next slide, please. Okay. So ad additional rules, we mentioned one with UVC need to be created, but ASHRAE also recommends other things. Well, maybe you're installing portable room air cleaners with HEPA filters. I've seen a lot of these on energy audits I've been doing recently. People are buying these portable cleaners and they use a certain amount of energy. Well, um, are people in the space or not? Do they actually need to be operated? I was in a, a school building and the, um, the cafeteria had a cleaner in there, but this was the day that they didn't have anyone in there. So there was no reason to be running the cleaner. So um, one of the things to do is you can add additional um, BAS points, connect to a, an electrical panel, for example. Um, you could do this in the kitchen also if the kitchen has things left on like the coffee makers and to make sure that things are shut off when people aren't there. So this actually gives an opportunity um, to um, look at opportunities to reduce energy consumption um, through new faults that are created based on new equipment that's been installed. Okay, next slide, please. So I'm not giving specific dollars, but just kind of a relative perspective on energy impact and how your changes may impact the energy consumption in the building. Clearly, if you're running equipment a lot more hours and using a lot more outside air, it's going to be using a lot more money because you're, you have to heat it, you have to cool it, and you're running the fan energy. It's specifically, it's very noticeable in environments that are not temperate. In an environment like California, where the temperatures are more moderate, you could probably bring in a lot more outside air. Um, the next one is cha changes made room air cleaners, additional humidification, filtration, even additional air change per hour rates if they're not significantly increased. You will be using more energy, but it's uh, it may be a way to go in terms of how to run under COVID-19. And then there are some other means, your hours of operation. You, you may actually be shutting off equipment or shutting off um, HVAC, not providing heating or cooling if you have spaces in your building that are not currently in use right now, and there's no reason to heat, cool them, or provide outside air to them. And UVC is also one, it's, I've done a few calculations, it's probably a little, you save a little energy from it, you have additional energy from the lighting, but you have other benefits from it as well, so actually you could use a little less energy as a result of it. Next slide, please. So let's kind of summarize the, the three main things. We will be, you're required to modify the rules in FDD, suspend some of them and provide additional ones. There are a lot of economizer and outside air rules that are already written and these need to be looked through and modified based on the way you want to be operating the building. The same thing with any kind of air change rates or filters, it's going to be impacting how your system's operating and the rules need to reflect your current operations, not the previous operations. Some of the rules need to be suspended uh, like demand control, ventilation, and heat recovery, anything that's going to be bringing in less outside air, the flip of what we normally would do, um, those rules need to be suspended. And there'll be additional rules created based on additional pieces of equipment. And as we do this, we also need to make sure it matches up with what the uh, controls vendor is doing. So their sequence of operation and the rules need to reflect each other. So it's it's important, again, that they all work as a team in terms of the facilities group, the controls vendor, and uh, the EMIS vendor. Next slide, please. So in summary, how, how do we succeed? How do you make a successful, healthy building during uh, conditions of COVID-19? As I mentioned, coordination, it's, it's really important to talk to each other so they're not doing things independently. If the facilities department decides we're going to replace all the filters, but they don't let anyone else know about that, then the EMIS vendor is going to show more faults of things uh, flagging all the time. 
if you can get the documentation to actually look at the summary of the list of rules that need to be changed, keep the old ones, know what the current ones are, and be able to change them later on. So you have at least three sets of rules summarized so you know that you can make changes to them on the fly. Now, some people can make these changes internally. Some require an outside firm to do it. But the key is to be able to make them under the correct operating conditions and, and document the dates. So you're, how are you operating based on the beginning under COVID-19? How are you operating now? As things change in the next couple of months, are you going to continue to operate that way? Or do you need another round to, to make another change a month from now? So planning on how frequently it's, people need to change and, um, and coordinating that. And uh, I like to mention, um, I've looked at all, hundreds of thousands of data points and two of the main things I like to indicate is anything you can monitor, you can create a rule for. So the more data that you can bring in, the more uh, successful you can be. It doesn't mean you need all the data points, but it's good to have it available and document. Document the sequence of operation and the rules. So which ones take priority? Documentation and availability of points to monitor provide for uh, a much easier time to be successful. Next question. Next slide, please. Well, and thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, David, so much. Um, that was a great presentation. We have a number of questions to get through. Um, I'm going to start off with one about economizers. And the question is, some organizations have decided to maintain diagnostics for economizers in the pre-COVID configuration so they can calculate the additional cost impact of the modified sequence under the COVID requirement. Um, have you experienced it? So they're operating the old way and they want to know what the additional costs would be? They're, they're operating under new COVID requirements, but they're leaving the FDD under pre-COVID configuration so they can calculate the energy waste relative to the new uh, requirements for COVID. So, have you seen that? So I have that seen them doing the savings calculation. Um, I would change the flag though the the rule to be under the new operation so if it's under 40 percent i'd want to know if you're getting below that instead of the 20 percent for example so you can definitely do the savings calculation but you should uh, be now looking at rules under how you want the building to be operating now so yes for the savings but i would modify the rule to indicate uh, so it would show up under the new conditions okay so you're kind of saying do both you know Make sure you're flagging what the conditions you want to be, and then also you can, in the, behind the scenes, do the calculation for the energy waste for that new operating scheme. Exactly. It's really important to have the flags be based on the new conditions, though, because this is not just energy, but also you're trying to increase the safety and make it a, a safer building for people to be in. So we want to make it uh, the flags based on the current COVID-related operations. Right. All right, um, the next question is, I wondered if you could talk more about the use of FDD for performance monitoring. Um, so it's more than the alarms uh, and, and the faults individually, but you can, can you see summaries of all zones or all air handlers to have assurance to occupants that things are working right? So, um... The advantage of using an EMIS and FTD is if it's been um, done effectively and if, if you're able to get all the points, you can absolutely look at the performance everywhere. So from a zone point of view, you should be able to look at all the zones in the building. So if you have a floor with, let's say with 10 offices, you can look at all 10 of them and see what the zone temperature and set point are. And you could also look at the, the VAV damper position and indicate which ones are getting more air, which are getting less, what temperatures you're maintaining. And you can tell um, if it's summarized right, you, are you looking for like on a dashboard? I mean, bringing all that data back. I guess the question right, is, right. the information is there. If it's set up as a dashboard, you could just flag, these are the, the zones that are not bringing in what they're supposed to. Because if you show every single one, it could be pretty, uh, pretty extensive uh, screen. Um, 
So I know some of the BAS is what you'll see is each one of the zones with a temperature sensor and you can click on it. So if you change it to a different color. So the answer is yes. Um, it, it depends on what kind of a dashboard you have set up for your FTD to indicate that basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you could have a dashboard that showed uh, the, the damper position for all your VAV boxes or the flow if you have it in a single kind of uh, chart basically maybe by floor or something you could do that or i mean you could also have them set up so certain ones are a certain color and if you don't know what's wrong with it you just click on that and you can see okay it's the temperature or it's the damper so it'll just indicate there's something wrong with it in the first place uh overall mm -hmm. so there are a lot of ways to summarize it that uh, could be useful for an individual building owner or uh, operator uh-huh great um, so this question is related to when you talked about like uh, making the changes and that process of working with your EMIS vendor. Um, so what factors affect how long the FDD modifications will take? So you want to make these modifications. How? What are the factors that um, might make it go smoother or might make it more difficult uh, working with your FDD technology? Um, so one of the, the big ones may actually not be your EMIS provider, but it may be your controls vendor, your BAS vendor. If they have to physically be there and make the changes, they may not have enough people to go across. So getting somebody who's available to actually be on site at the same time, coordinating the timing of everything. So I would have a I would have a list of all the changes you want to make prepared ahead of time and try to schedule and coordinate the time with everyone because people are usually putting out fires. So this is uh, in COVID-19, there are a lot of fires to put out. So this is one you need to coordinate the timing of everyone and have that list prepared beforehand. So you can just go through a checklist and make sure. And then also not just the implementation, but I would check the next day to make sure it's been implemented properly. Because sometimes you think it's uh, been programmed correctly, but they may have put a, a minus side or sign or a plus side in. So I wouldn't just assume that it's 100% correct um, after it's been changed. Mm -hmm. Um, are there any other factors related to how the, the FDD was set up initially? So there are a couple ways of making the changes. If a building has a global change, it may be very quick and you could just talk to your EMIS provider and they might be able to make the changes uh, that day. Uh, if it's individual air handling units um, and zones, it may take a lot longer to do. So the, the more global changes, it can be the better. It depends how it was programmed, who you use as your EMIS vendor. I would think in most cases, it would be pretty quick to do um, based on the parameters that need to be changed. And okay. they go back in time also. If you make a change a week later, you can actually go back in time because they maintain that data. So it can let you know how you performed in the previous week also. It doesn't have to be set up for exactly that day, but you can actually see how how is it performed. Oh, so that. run run the faults historically on the old data too. Yeah, you can run it on the old, you yeah. can set up a date that you want to start it effectively and run it backwards. Mm -hmm. So if you want to see how, we've been, how have we been performing since last summer under COVID, and one of the things I look for, even on the utility side, when I look at that is, okay, tell me how the building was operating now versus the year before. So you want to look at the faults based on this mode of operation. So maybe you waited two weeks or a month to actually do this. Well let's see how we were performing a month before this. Um, it doesn't mm -hmm. mean you're going to save more energy, but just get an idea of how it was operating under the newer conditions. And that kind of goes to um, looking at those heat maps. Um, you had mentioned in your earlier slide, uh, you, you showed that heat map to look at yep. the annual energy use. And um, I remember you telling me that there's, there wasn't as much change as you might think between the previous year and this year, um, even though the building wasn't as occupied. So, yeah, that was that's right. That's a building that uh, the that's real heat map data where they decided to keep things operating pretty much the same. They may have increased um, hours actually a little bit for flush, um, basically flushing the system, but they were letting the economizers run. I do not believe they even changed the filters out. So the idea was just to maintain. The, the normal operation because they had very few people in the building, but they weren't shutting things off mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so along those lines, uh, the other, next question is, what are the most common changes? You know, we talked about these mitigation strategies. What are the most common ones you've seen in the field? So outside air is a big one in terms of how much outside air you want to bring in, how much you want to increase it. Um, but that's also dependent on what your outside air weather conditions are. In the middle of winter time, do you really want to bring in that much additional outside air? So um, in all the buildings I've been in, I have not actually seen as many filter changes here. This is in the, the Boston area, as I thought. Some of them have increased their filters maybe from a MERV 8 to a MERV 11, but not even up to a MERV 13. Some of them haven't changed them at all. Um, it's more of the individual. Um, people have talked a lot about UVC, but I haven't seen a lot of installations at least yet. It doesn't mean they're not coming in. I just personally haven't seen them yet. Um, the the air cleaners, I'm seeing a few of them installed in, in classrooms or areas, areas that don't typically have a lot of outside air available in the first place. They're buying the portable air cleaners or upping their uh, filtration because they can't bring in more outside air. So it, it kind of depends on the situation that you're in. If you're able to bring in more outside air, they're typically doing that. But again, based on the outside air conditions. What about hours of operation? I'm curious what you're seeing around that. So I haven't seen too many things actually shut down. I've seen more uh, additional hours that they just want to run the building the way it was operating beforehand, and they don't want to really shut down the building. So they may actually mm -hmm. add a few more hours in, like that, that one building I was talking about, um, or they're operating pretty much the same as they were beforehand. But they're not going 24-7? I haven't seen too many people going 24-7, no. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, next question. Is COVID driving even more value for FDD? So driving more value. So um, I guess the answer is it depends. If to the previous question, if you're able to shut down different areas, if people feel comfortable doing that, I would push them to to shut down certain areas. And if they're not um, and you can find that on the FDD, I would say that would drive more savings. Um, from an um, economizer point of view or outside air, the answer is probably no. Um, it, it's one of those questions that depends. For specific systems, I'd well, say yes, in terms of this is I think value time. isn't just, value from isn't a just dollar point savings, of view, I would say definitely. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. For a healthier building, I would say absolutely, because you're already, that's one of the reasons why hopefully that you have it in the first place. I know people do it for energy, but it's also you want to have a healthy building. So I would say it, you definitely provide a healthier building. I would say it increases that. It's definitely a plus, provides mm -hmm. a lot more value. So is it a good idea to add FDD now? Have you seen an increase in interest? Um, from owners and understanding FDD to add it. I had a call with someone this morning about installing it. They were looking at it as a pharmaceutical and they're very interested in doing it. They're they're not necessarily operating their building different under COVID, but they see more value from it. I think under COVID, you may have more people understanding the value where beforehand they just saw it as more of energy savings. Now they see it as building operations. So I do believe there's more interest in it now. Mm -hmm. um, another question here about, you know, going back to the energy impact, maybe we can go back to that slide, um, Nina, that was a few slides ago with, uh, next one, yeah, that one. Um, so can you talk some more about the strategies, like the relative uh, energy impact of the different strategies and um, what you're kind of seeing for the increase in energy at facilities that, that do these mitigation strategies? So again, it, it really depends on how much outside air you want to bring in. For someone who's bringing in a lot, who had 20% and now they're bringing 100% outside air, it's going to be a pretty significant increase. Your costs are going to go up pretty significantly. You'll see it on the bills. If you're just replacing the filters and you're going from a MERV 8 or MERV 11 to a MERV 13, you may not see a significant increase. You'll see a little bit of an increase in terms of energy cost. 
but again, where there's additional costs, there's also opportunity to shut things off also. So you get some additional savings from that. It, it's hard to put a specific number on it because some people may only increase it, like I said, 20 to 40%. Some may try to bring in more. And if you're bringing in more outside air, when the weather isn't that different, you're not gonna have that much additional energy use for heating or cooling. Um, if the systems aren't designed to handle that much heating or cooling, um, and you can't maintain the space conditions, I, I wouldn't recommend doing that. The filters are a better option. I mean, do you, I'm not gonna give a specific, do this or do that, but they, the idea is to mitigate the risk based on your building itself. What's the best opportunity I have to uh, not use as, as much additional energy, a lot of additional energy, but also provide for a safe environment for uh, people in the building. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's it's hard to put a specific number on it. It's 10 to 20% more energy for the air handling unit. It's, it's, I mean, it, it's gonna be more if, with a lot more outside air. And the same with the hours of operation. So if you're talking about operating uh, 10 hours a day, and then you go to 12 hours a day, you get a 20% increase just in the fan energy, um, potentially, and not including the heating or cooling. And if you're going 24 hours a day, you could double the amount of fan energy from going from 12 to 24, if they're not, if they're constant uh, volume. If they're VAV and they're modified, uh, not as much, but you'll still notice it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely impacts there. Um, I think one more question while we'll time for, um, are there any like additional sensors or maybe additional needs for center, sensors that you see relative to, to you know, looking at different um, rules for COVID operations that might be interesting to owners? Um, are there, you so, know, bringing in more data than you had before, is there a need for that? So I'm gonna actually answer that a different way because in most cases, a lot of what FDD actually finds is sensors that have never been calibrated or that aren't working correctly in the first place. So this may actually bring an opportunity saying, well, I think we're bringing in more outside air, but the sensors are telling me we're not, or they're, they're telling me we're bringing more outside air, but when we take a manual reading, it's not the case. So instead of adding additional sensors for FDD, maybe the thing is to replace some of the existing ones or have them calibrated to make sure they're bringing accurate information. Yeah, which sensors do you see are most uh, problematic to the FDD process? So outside air temp for sure. <laughs> well, so the outside air temperature one's a really interesting one. It depends on the building and how they're they're doing it. Some of them have individual outside air sensors per air handler. Some have it one per building. Some have one per campus. I guess I'd want to make sure which one are you using? Are you using the the one that's the most accurate for that specific air handling unit. The mixed air temperature sensor is an averaging one, which is typically okay. However, I've seen stratification with bad values in terms of larger air handling units. Um, you could have a, the larger systems have multiple sensors typically, and they may need the most help. Um, I, I've seen one where they were in um, series, where you had three temperature sensors together, and one of them um, was, this was, I believe they were preheat temperature sensors. Two of them were reading about, right, let's let's say 80 degrees on heating, and then one of them was like 150. But um, you didn't know which that one of them was bad, just that uh, the average of all three of them was higher than expected. Mm. So it was an opportunity mm -hmm. to go in. Uh, now, I would like to see the sensors worked on. There are some, building facilities groups so that they don't want to touch any of this stuff under COVID. They just want to keep things operating a certain way. So while I say this is a good time to check on those, some people may decide that this is not, well, it's the right time to do it in terms of uh, understanding what's going on in the building. They don't want to play with the air handlers at all at this point. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and, and what about um, CO2 sensing? Do you think that's important, either existing or additional ones for the future for making sure about occupancy levels? So CO2 sensors are a good one, depending if they're added into the return duct or if they're added in specific zones and average. Again, this is one of those that typically does not get um, high priority. I've seen plenty of them that are reading um, values that are unexpected and they don't take a high priority, maybe as a result of 
COVID, they'll take a higher priority to understand that there are people in here and you need to, to do something about it. So I would say that and the fact that you see more demand um, control ventilation coming out, I would think that they're gonna be more important going forward. But it, again, it, it's a slow progress because people are adding them in, but they don't generally look at them for calibration. It, it's just mm -hmm. there's too many sensors for them. Which are the ones that they're gonna focus on and how frequently? Right. Thanks. Um, one last question here. Uh, humidity may be important for COVID. Do you see more attention paid to relative humidity? So in terms of whether or not to humidify a space or? Well, to make sure you're within the range appropriate to reducing virus. I think. So a lot of what they talk about is a 40 to 60%. So if you if the question is, would you add the sensors in and add the humidification to the system? Um, um, you can, it, it's it's probably costly if you're gonna do it in a lot of different places. And um, again, humidifiers are one of those things that typically fail, unless it's a very specific space that people pay attention to, like an operating room or like a, a library that requires certain conditions all the time. Um, from a from a COVID safety and re mitigation point of view, it's does it help? Probably, but is it the area that I would focus on? I'd probably focus. This is me talking. I mean, I don't want to give. I don't want to say do it or don't do it, but I think I would work more with your existing systems and what you have. Mm-hmm. Um. So the question was, do you see more attention paid to it? It sounds like not, not really. Much. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was our last question. We're going to have time for um, Nina. Could you go to the very end? Um, actually, the previous slide would be helpful. So I wanted to thank David for his great presentation. Thanks for being guest presenter today. Um, we have. I just wanted to make sure everyone knows how to be on the EMIS Tech Team list. Um, we make sure that you know about future webinars. Um, we have a slate of webinars um, we're planning for this year. So contact Valerie Nibbler there at her email if you want to be a part of that. Um, the Better Buildings Alliance in general uh, gives you even more opportunities to connect with other owners and get more technical support. So let us know if you have questions about that or uh, join through the website. And Again, I'll, I'll give one more plug for if you know a utility that's interested in learning more about the results of the Smart Energy Analytics campaign and how potentially you might be able to get incentive programs um, in your area for EMIS-related um, opportunities, uh, let us know. Give me a, an email at hcreamer at lbl.gov. So we're trying to do a, a push for outreach to utilities that are interested in learning more. So. Um, thank you for your for your time today. We're at the top of the hour, and thanks for your your great questions. Thanks, everyone.